Welcome um, to this, the second of the Humanitas Lectures in Sustainability this year. Um, for those of you who were here, not here, but who were at the lecture yesterday at the Department of Geography, welcome back. Clearly what you heard and saw was uh, interesting enough for you to come back. For those who weren't here, I can assure you, you have a treat in store. So welcome to the lecture. Um, this lecture is part of the inaugural Humanitas Visiting Professorship in Sustainability Studies. Uh, which has been made possible by the generous support of the TELUS Martyr Foundation and has been organized in collaboration with CRASH, uh, Cambridge's Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, uh, with collaboration from the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. Uh, this is the first year of the Chair in Sustainability Studies. The plan is to have uh, uh, the program running over the next five years, so there will be several um, distinguished visitors who will be coming to Cambridge to deliver similar lectures over the course of this series. Um, the intention is that it will touch a number of uh, topics relating to sustainability, including environment and behavior, policy and economics. Um, this particular series consists of three lectures and a symposium. The first lecture was yesterday. There will be a third lecture here at the law faculty on the 4th of November at 5 p.m. and a concluding seminar on Tuesday the 5th of November at the pit building in the center of town where a number of people will respond to the lectures and will start a discussion and that will take place over the better part of that afternoon between 2 and 6 p.m. on Tuesday the 5th. So I look forward to seeing you at uh, several of the subsequent events. Turning to our lecturer tonight, um, Gretchen Daly is an ecologist by training and her work spans a wide range including scientific research, teaching, public education and working with leaders to advance practical approaches to environmental challenges. Um, she has a very diverse portfolio of research and has published extensively. Uh, amongst her various accomplishments um, has been the co-founding of the Natural Capital Project, which has been a very influential um, international effort combining inputs from academia and the research community as well as the applied practitioner community to try and think about the ways in which uh, ecosystem services and conservation can actually be implemented in particular parts of the world. Uh, Gretchen works extensively with landowners, economists, lawyers, business people and government agencies to try and incorporate some of her thinking into business practice and public policy. So with that as introduction, can I just invite Gretchen to come and talk to us about the second of her themes for this, for this series, which is on nature's computing values. Gretchen, thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a Friday evening, so I really appreciate your coming out. I imagine this is more of the diehard group. And um, <clears throat> so I'd love to um, just have more of an interactive discussion if, if anybody's game. Just um, raise your hand or shout out or throw chocolate kisses or <laughs> rotting tomatoes down here. <laughs> and um, I'd, I want to say, sort of opening up a little bit more personally that um, I've been so influenced by people here. I was just talking a minute ago um, with Bhavik about how much Parthada Skupta, for example, um, influenced kind of our career paths and personal passions and things. And um, similarly on the ecological side, there's so many people here at Cambridge that have kind of shaped the way I think. And so it's, I, maybe you can reset me if I've been going off the path <laughs> a bit. Um, but what I'd love to do is kind of reflect a little bit on where our collective communities have come over the past um, maybe 10 to 15 years. I'm going to go back about 15 years just to um, prompt us to think how rapidly things are changing and, and then also to pause and think about whether we're on kind of a good looking path from the perspective of where we'd like to end up. Um, <clears throat> things are happening so swiftly everywhere in the world. If I'm going to talk quite a bit about China here, but any place we have our eyes on, we see, we see change as the dominant kind of dimension. And uh, certainly in China, trying to think about how to harmonize, as people say there, <clears throat> people and nature. Um, it's kind of the challenge of our time, and nobody really knows how to do it. <laughs> um, and Indeed, in any dimension, you find 
competing values. There's sort of no way to get it all at this stage. There, there's just so much um, pressure from humanity. And just to give one example that I'm sure many of you know well, it's basically until the next asteroid hits the planet, you know, it's people much more than any other force that will dictate the future of all known life. You know, we're, we're expected within this 100 year period to wipe out or commit to extinction over half of um, life forms that were here basically when humanity came onto the scene. So it's pretty dramatic and, and with whatever remain will have a tremendous influence on their sort of ecological and evolutionary trajectories and huge implications for human life. So um, in kind of the race to develop knowledge around this set of changes, the complexity, um, and to try and apply that knowledge in really beneficial ways where there's opportunity and um, build momentum from there to, to you know, move into places where the opportunity might be less ripe, but where we can ideally start cultivating the conditions that would lead to better, better sort of outcomes for people in nature. Um, it, I sometimes feel uneasy over whether kind of we're thinking about everything um, that we ought to be thinking about. So that's what I'd like to dive into here. And I'd love um, to hear, I know we have a diverse group, so hear different sorts of perspectives. So feel free, please, to um, interrupt at any time. What I'd like to do is go back to the mid-90s when a really um, <clears throat> kind of well-known case came up. In fact, people got sick of this case. Do, do you know about the New York City watershed? Okay, so it was sort of, Maybe the, the first example where some decision makers in the city here um, had actually considered the values of you know, investing in natural capital in order to achieve this primary goal of securing water quality for the nine million people drinking New York's water. And I'll just mention it briefly and spare anybody who's heard it 50 times um, a, a detailed rendition, but it, it had a big impact. It kind of captured the imagination just because the city is so well known. And many people just couldn't believe, first of all, that there was this connection between water down here through their, their plumbing and um, activities up in the Catskills, Delaware watershed about 100 miles to the north of the city. And um, you know what had prompted awareness of this connection and of an opportunity to do things differently was another development boom. There have been many waves of development in and around New York. And here, you know, people building modest little homes right along stream sides with some chemicals going in undoubtedly from the lawns. And um, that led to a dip in water quality. And the US Environmental Protection Agency is always kind of monitoring what's going on and said, OK, you have to do something. And the price tag of building another filtration plant, and they had one here on this watershed, which supplies about 10% of the supply to the city. Um, so they had a decent sense of what the cost would be. And it was astronomical from a city budget point of view. It was six to eight billion dollars, as compared to, you know, making the story short, maybe a one to one and a half billion dollar investment in watershed protection that could achieve, um, it was hoped, the same outcome. So this launched a big experiment. And there are a whole bunch of these experiments running around the world now. This one's still going. It's written up every few years. There have been National Academy reports on it. And um, cities around the world more and more are looking to this kind of a model, um, not as a sole solution. There's still a lot of um, engineering infrastructure and things needed to deliver safe drinking water, but <clears throat> as a key part to water security. So that was back in the mid-90s. Um, and it did involve, <clears throat> I guess one big thing I want to emphasize is how much of um, an effort there is in bringing people on board. So in order to be effective, these, these investments in um, changing land use and farming and forestry practices and things, <clears throat> they really had to engage a lot of people. So they're, all these little red and yellow dots show different um, farming and forestry communities that got on board. Over 90% of 
got on board pretty much right away with the incentives being offered. And <clears throat> by getting on board, I mean they um, agreed, like this um, dairy farmer, Dave Hawley, whom I happened to interview, to um, embark on pretty <coughs> significant changes. There hadn't been much change in the dairy industry over a long period. And here the city um, told him to get rid of his old um, beautiful historic barn because the, the young cows in there were getting sick much more often they, than they should and their health is intimately connected to the health of people drinking water downstream, you get the same diseases. And um, <clears throat> so the city gave him this $50,000 solar heated tent sort of thing and in that the cows fare a lot better from a health point of view and there are a lot of data on that. Similarly, you know, they put in fences the city bought up and restored marsh habitat to appropriate land that they could get their hands on at fair market value. So there were a bunch of things done, and in a way when I went there I, I was disappointed. I had thought there was going to be some incredible rocket science that had come in and transformed this place, but in, it was actually, you know, the rocket science is all on the social side, kind of lining up incentives and people and um, making a deal. And that's what this is about in every situation. And the question for us, I think, um, considering whether we're on the right path from sort of ethical and also pragmatic standpoints, leading to more durable, sustainable outcomes for people and nature, you know, is are we running these deals in a, in a good way? So from New York, I'll give you one other example from close to my home. You guys know about Napa, because I know Cambridge people drink a lot of wine. Um, so the, the wine region is really beautiful. You drive through it and it looks like this. And you would never know that um, many people have died. And there's been about, I think about $60 million in damages from flooding of the town of Napa over the past 40 or so years. So there's the Napa River and um, it had been pretty hemmed in. I went there right after the change, so I didn't get a good picture of all the dikes and levees, but mainly they had channeled the river with these concrete dike and levee systems to help protect people from floods. But it wasn't very successful over this period, and um, in, again, a long process that took probably eight or so years to play out, and that continues as an experiment. It's held up now as sort of the poster child by the Army Corps of Engineers. People in the town <clears throat> evaluated their options for, you know, after yet another flood and decided in favor of investing in natural capital. And here, in contrast to the New York case, and this again is back in the 1990s, the interesting thing is that the um, natural capital investment was expected to be higher than the, um, you know, sort of physical capital, gray infrastructure investment. But people voted for it nonetheless, partly because of intense um, cultivation and I change in ideas and engagement of people by some artists, uh, sort of a writer who had seen this kind of work going on in another place, as well as some young grad students from UC Berkeley. It was kind of an interesting mix of people engaging the community to think differently. And the community decided, okay, it was worth taxing themselves. They actually raised their local sales tax and um, used other financial mechanisms to get this full price tag here. Um, and they decided it would be worth it anticipating many other benefits apart from flood control to come from this natural capital approach. And another experiment playing out that you can read about in Wine Country magazine and things like that. Um, but they took this so-called living river approach. Um, they moved a lot of homes that had been there since the founding of the city, so there were of deep cultural and historical um, losses in some ways. Um, but it, and they moved a bunch of bridges. It was rather expensive, but created this wetland that captures the energy of a river when it's running high. And um, you can see that there are all these other benefits that have come from it. There's a lot of ecotourism there now. There's this big culinary institute. Um, the town of Napa hadn't had anything in it before, basically mostly shut up businesses because they couldn't get flood insurance. Now that they can, they I mean, you can have romance in these fine restaurants and all kinds of other stuff. So um, it seems like sort of a win-win, right?
but how, how well can we really achieve these outcomes and how um, would we try to replicate something like this? That's what I want to get into. So the initial cases seemed easy. Then there were, there were all these weird cases like, have you guys heard of this one, biodegradation? <laughs> we don't tend to think about biodegradation services, about all the um, piles of waste that we would be um, smothered by if we didn't have you know, these billions of <laughs> or, you know, untold numbers of microbes and other things decomposing and recycling it for us, okay? So Dan Jansen, who many of you will know anybody in ecology at Penn, had the brilliant idea in Costa Rica to um, expand this national park network that he played a big role in setting up by getting orange juice companies to pay for biodegradation services. So he's been a big um, leader in creative solutions here. And here's this Willy Wonka-like um, orange juice factory out in um, Guanacaste, the dry part of Costa Rica. And um, <clears throat> there's these trucks that come, just tons and tons of pulp that come from making the juice. So they, they smash the oranges, get the juice out, they take out the essential oils and also sell that. Um, but then they end up with this pulp <clears throat> and they had nothing they could easily do with it. It's expensive to turn it into livestock pellets and people, some people dump it you know, in streams. That's no good either. So um, there's Dan in his little Santa Claus outfit. And his deal was to get the orange juice companies to bring the pulp to this area that he wanted to restore. It's very hard to restore tropical dry forest that's been taken over by invasive uh, grasses. And in this case, it's um, a grass from Asia that, South Asia, that um, has been there for a couple hundred years. It's just not going to move. It's very fire prone and it self perpetuates. But if you dump tons and tons of orange peels on it, then <laughs> within a very short period of time, this, this is literally two years later, and it might not look like anything to a non ecologist, but these are mainly native plants popping up, <laughs> and, and it did trigger a change after 200 years of sort of being locked into this undesirable state that wasn't, the grasses weren't very usable by cattle and he wanted to turn this into a park anyway. Um, so it looked like a win-win and he just kind of made up some numbers. Um, and, and just, he needed the company to pay a certain amount so that over 20 years, he needed about $480,000. <laughs> and he, so he gave them this pricing there's no, Partha's probably wincing, there's no like solid <laughs> valuation going on here. It was just give me the money, I'm going to buy this land and that's what happened. But then this competing orange juice company got wind of it. They're located too far to make it worthwhile to truck their peels up to the, the site and they filed a lawsuit and it turned out um, there were all these relationships. Costa Rica is a small country between the heads of the companies and who was in governments and in the judiciary and things, and it worked out unfavorably, and this, this deal ended up getting canceled. So it's just to show you that there are many of these idiosyncratic projects that have gone south <laughs> as well as a bunch that seem to have these sort of win-win outcomes. And now what's happening um, is there is a big scaling up, and that's where it's, it's really a critical moment to think through what are the elements that you want to have kind of in place in order to ensure the kinds of outcomes people hope for. So in Costa Rica they did, this was right at my table, um, <laughs> my orange juice, but um, <laughs> the, uh, they got this eco-ok -okay label, but it only lasted a few years. Um, so Costa Rica was one of the first places to scale up, really um, inspiring leadership there. The, head of the country at the time, Oscar Arias, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for a lot of innovative, far-sighted policies, um, and many having to do with the environment. So together with many others in his cabinet, including, um, um, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, a good friend of mine, uh, Alvaro Maña. <laughs> Alvaro headed up the first ever in Ministry of Energy and in the Environment. So Costa Rica had neither of those ministries before, I don't think, and he put them together because he was trained as, an, as a hydrologist and recognized the connection between Costa Rica's um, 
hydropower economy. They, that was like the second biggest source of income for the country after tourism. Um, they sell hydropower to neighboring countries. And the um, economics of hydropower are such that you really want to limit sedimentation coming in behind your, your big investments. And, um, and to do that, you need forests. So the, and yet the country was in a period of the highest rate of deforestation in the world, over 4% per year up into the early 1990s. So Alvaro Lamagna and a team of others um, invented, they were really the first, um, the idea, or, or not so much the idea, they implemented the idea of um, kind of commodifying, you could say, some of these benefits that come from tropical forest. So they, and what they thought they'd do is, you know, they offered the first climate offsets, um, these little water purification credits that would go to the hydropower company. They really wanted to get biodiversity in there. And um, ecotourism was such a big part of the economy. They wanted tourists somehow to help finance this. Um, what ended up happening after a lot of political struggle was um, two interesting things. One is that most of the payments come from a carbon a tax on gasoline bought at, the, at gas stations. Uh, they weren't able to get anything from tourists. There's just too much political pressure to keep tourism revenues flowing where they were going. Um, and then a second interesting thing is that they decided to set the payment rate at a really low level. And that was because they didn't want many people to jump into this. It was brand new. Um, they wanted to sort of work out the kinks in the system. And so they set it at $50 per hectare per year. And with that little amount of money, you, were, you had the option of um, putting up some land. It could be any land, you know, any tiny parcel, and either reforesting it or conserving the forest that was on it already. And the little bit of forest shown here actually is a patch that is getting this payment today. And you can see it's um, starting to recover that little triangular bit of about 30 hectares. Um, <clears throat> but then the surprising thing is that this program was just vastly oversubscribed overnight by all kinds of people. And it um, firstly showed that you know, the opportunity to conservation, the opportunity cost, was a lot lower than people had imagined. So tons of people were willing to give up whatever they were doing and say, OK, I'll take this $50. So I think there's a lesson in that broadly. We really don't know often what the opportunity costs are. It's hard to ascertain those. And we need, we need to get a better way, a better set of ways of, of working that out. I know in Australia, they do all these sorts of reverse options, <laughs> auctions and things to figure out um, what the costs might really be. But, but that was an interesting insight here. Um, so this system is still going on. And on Monday, I'm going to talk about they're trying to expand it to cover forest and sort of valuable elements of native habitat on farmland. So they did manage through this program and many other policy changes that were made at the same time to arrest their deforestation rate. And they not, now actually have a net increase in forest cover, although they're still declining in some you know, old growth forest. Um, but it's very hard to credit, you know, to apportion credit to any of these programs. And this because we really don't have a good counterfactual to see what would have happened in the absence of this one program and all that. And the program has been criticized um, heavily by, from different angles. One prominent angle is in that they, where they weren't being strategic and trying to get kind of maximum economic efficiency and getting people to enroll who, whose land was very likely to be deforested or never reforested and whose land was especially important for delivering this suite of benefits that, <clears throat> that come from it. Instead, they were letting anybody enroll in the program. But if you talk to the people there, they, that was their whole idea. And it explains, I finally figured out why Costa Rica has, as the national bird, one of the most drab birds on the planet, <laughs> even though they've got some of the most extraordinary birds <laughs> um, in the world. Does anybody know why they chose the clay-colored robin? as the national bird. Um, it's, because it's considered the bird for everyone. It's the one, it's, it has a beautiful song. 
and <clears throat> this robin that you can you wake up to this song wherever you are you can be in downtown san jose the capital city and you'll wake up to this song along with trucks rumbling by and diesel fumes but the bird will be out there doing its thing um, or you can be in the countryside or deep in forest this bird is common in all these different habitats and that's why they picked it and somehow i hadn't hadn't known that till recently um, and it was a similar philosophy for this payment system. They, they really wanted to shift norms and to make everyone feel that conservation was an opportunity and also a responsibility. And, and there's a lot of discussion of that. And so I wonder what we ought to be doing. There are all these risks associated with paying people for things that maybe we ought to do anyway, but aren't likely to do without some kind of economic compensation. So I'd love to hear thoughts on this kind of approach. So they've stuck with this approach. They're prioritizing a bit more now, but are also really keen to maintain um, <clears throat> their thinking here. So now um, <clears throat> I'm going to move to kind of a scaling up. We'll jump into China now. And the idea here is to build on kind of the efforts that were underway that everybody was quite aware of globally when some big catastrophes hit China that I, I mentioned yesterday of flooding and drought and many other <clears throat> kind of sandstorms, other things that are going on there at scales you just don't experience elsewhere very commonly. So <clears throat> the theory of change just is, you know, that we're, this is sort of the broader community and it's part of what the Natural Capital Project has kind of espoused, but <clears throat> I'd love to get, you know, criticism and thoughts on how this might be modified. But the idea is co-developing tools that, you know, if we think about what's limiting the spread of these kinds of approaches when there are a lot of benefits that seems to be gained, well, maybe we need better tools to help pinpoint investments or at least make the business case for what the return on investment would be um, in natural capital. <clears throat> we need to work through these policy processes with um, participation to have you know effective implementation and then um, work with leaders and build capacity to help mainstream the thinking so that's it broadly and just to set this out um, and then think about where we're heading here and then I'll dive into the China examples you know there are these different pathways along which we're all working in different ways to try and achieve this change at one level at universities and other research institutions, um, just the research innovation, the change in thinking has had a profound impact on people all over the world. And I mentioned yesterday that, um, you know, there's so many good training programs actually like that Partha and Carl Jaron Mailer got going with the Bayer Institute in Ecological Economics that has spawned these networks all over the world of people working on this kind of stuff at the kind of deep thinking level um, and training capacity building level. Or here in Cambridge, it's so impressive to see how much you engage people in cultivating new leaders to bring new ideas and new approaches into conservation in many new arenas. So that's that part. <clears throat> but then there's also been a really important role of very simple sorts of tools and approaches that just change the way people frame problems. So tools that shape minds. I'm thinking of, for example, the World Resources Institute, but, but there are many other groups that have very powerful tools that get people to change the way they're thinking, understand a little bit about ecosystem services, maybe get stakeholders in a particular conflict focused a little bit on those and what the um, implications would be for options and for actual solutions, um, mediating differences. And then there are these tools where we are now more, although all of this is key, but moving to higher ultimate impact, going to the right and down to the bottom, um, you know, trying to generate actions, developing, this is over again a couple decades, but really intensifying now, trying to lay out alternatives based on the framework, real scenarios where you lay out in some detail from sort of biophysical, economic, social, and other perspectives, maybe um, a range of other perspectives, you know, what the possibilities are, and then trying to develop plans and policies that integrate those kinds of options and analyses in them, finally to 
really deploying new policy and finance mechanisms that in the ideal would achieve this balance and improvement in both the biodiversity side and, and human well-being. And um, I, I just sort of lay this out because it, the country that's gone furthest that I know of, and I'd, I'd love to hear whether you dispute this, is China. And it, it might seem surprising to say that, but I know of no other place that has taken this on in such a breathtaking scale and sort of level of ambition and degree of innovation. Um, there's obviously a lot going on in China and the other realm, right? One hand is, the hand of destruction is still by far the much more powerful. But the efforts now to implement here are really quite astonishing. And so I'll go through a couple of examples now um, and we'll get to thinking about whether, given these examples, we really have an approach that is appropriate and that might be useful in a variety of social and political, cultural contexts around the world. So in China, policies um, are, are uh, I'll just say they come from, again, going back to the late 90s in this case, from these massive floods mostly, that's what people would trace them to, that led to the country you know, asking, okay, what can we do to help reduce this risk at least? And literally overnight, this was within a matter of months, this program was implemented called the Sloping Land Conversion Program. And imagine some of you know a lot about it, much more than I probably, also known as the Grain to Green Program, along with this somewhat smaller but also very impactful Natural Forest Conservation Program. And the idea was to <clears throat> halt and reverse the really rapid deforestation that had been going on in especially the upper reaches of many of the rivers. Um, and at the same time, the idea was to make a big wealth transfer. You can easily see that in the image here. These wealthier provinces, um, you know, paying into the central government, and then it's been about 100 billion US dollars over the past decade, roughly, that have gone into this program. There's been a massive increase in forest cover as a result. It's a mix of types. Some of it is this natural forest. A lot of it is um, orchards, more production forest. In a lot of places, like where you go to see the Great Wall, typically around <coughs> Beijing, it's, it's non-native trees. So there's a, a mixed set of outcomes, but they've restored something like 60 million hectares of forest in this really short time frame. And <clears throat> now they're going a lot further. So the, slide I showed yesterday um, maps out where they're investing now. This is a policy that's just being implemented now. About 27% of land area prioritized around different services. And um, the question is how do you achieve both poverty alleviation you know, and securing of natural capital um, in these kinds of places? What, what, where do you even start? And I'm going to show you the three places that have been teed up as priorities for analysis where work is ongoing. And the first we'll go to is Mirin Reservoir, which is the main surface water supply to Beijing. Um, <clears throat> this is really the only surface water source for Beijing now. They had another reservoir that was supplying the city, but that was deemed you know, unfit for human contact around the year 2000. And that um, caused you know, a lot of pressure and um, investment in a couple of major programs, one of which is to secure water from this alternative source near the city, about 100 kilometers to the north in Miyuin. This is the largest artificial lake in Asia. And here's where the lake is, <coughs> um, right there. So here's Beijing City. And it was a big negotiation. So it's a mountainous area up here. Um, about one quarter of it is managed you know, by Beijing and three quarters um, by Hebei, the neighboring province. Um, two big river systems flowing through it. And over time, they've been experiencing both you know, growth in population that's ongoing in Beijing and declining inflow. So if you look at these bars, <clears throat> they show mean precipitation and then this is runoff. So precip precipitation um, has been roughly constant over the past 
um, 40 or so years, 50 years, but um, runoff has been going down, and that's because of rice farmers and other abstractions you know, from the river system before the water gets to where people in Beijing could get their hands on it. So if you look at the two river systems, you also see that pollution rates were going up of nitrogen and phosphorus. This shows nitrogen concentrations. So the intent in this program was to address these issues, bring more water to Beijing, higher quantity, and also higher quality. So here's kind of the a pretty standard payment for ecosystem services um, framework that's a little bit narrower than what people are thinking about, but I'm going to use this just for the analysis. Um, and I should say, I didn't put it on here, but this was just published in PNAS by uh, the lead author is Zheng, Z-H-E-N-G, I send you the paper. Um, but the idea is to look at, okay, but these beneficiaries in the city, they're getting water, the ecosystem service flow is, you know, water um, from this set of providers living up in the watershed, and they want to induce livelihood changes. That's a huge part of all this, and this is a very simple framework here, but they're hoping to open non-farm sectors and to build capacity for people to get livelihoods in things other than farming. But that, that's proving a lot tougher in a longer term kind of process than just switching what they do um, and improving water delivery. Um, so what they did though in trying to achieve both goals is go in, they did a lot of surveys, determined kind of what the opportunity cost was to growing paddy rice, which had been growing up there for a long, long time, hundreds of years. Um, they enrolled literally overnight, again, most of the land, the vast majority of it, in a voluntary program. There was a lot of back and forth with farmers on how much they wanted to be paid. Then most of the farmers switched to dry land corn production. And so from the inception of this program in 2006 to 2010, they achieved this significant increase in water yield and a um, significant decrease in total nitrogen and in total phosphorus. So it's amazing how, rapid all that ha how rapidly all that happened. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at, there's a lot of interest in measuring kind of what the costs and benefits are to the different parties in these agreements. There's obviously a lot of discrepancy in power, but trying to get um, costs and benefits to work out favorably for everybody. So in terms of the providers, the farmers, the opportunity costs are here, the payments in P or green are up here. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the beneficiaries down in the city, the payments plus the transaction costs are also working out to be less as you'd want than the benefits of water quality and um, nutrient reduction. And then if you look overall, this is sort of the ratio. So the city is going a lot further with this and now trying to really pinpoint using this software system we developed for Latin America to just pinpoint where would you, rather than investing in everybody um, equally, where would you get the greatest payoff in another round um, in changing land use practices. Um, so that's a summary of what's going on in, in terms of achieving improved water <laughs> supply locally. Now, um, this was written up in The Economist I happened to see a couple weeks ago, if you want to look. There's a huge project that you've probably heard of, the South to North Water Transfer Scheme, that um, I see varying estimates of its cost, something between 70 and possibly much higher billion dollars going into bringing water from other parts of China up to the Beijing area. And one source of their three primary sources. The source for the so-called middle fork of this transfer scheme is here, this um, municipality called Ankang. It's made up of nine counties, the way <clears throat> these political jurisdictions run. And we've been working in a couple of the counties to um, basically analyze what the options are and maybe have some influence on how the program is implemented. Um, there's obviously a lot of sensitivity over it. The idea is to improve the natural capital by getting people to leave behind livelihoods on very steep, erodible um, parts of the landscape. 
and to move those people into more valley-like situations where activities would be more sustainable and ideally human well-being will be improved. And this all together would improve the quality of the water and possibly the timing of flow and other things for Beijing and in the ideal lead to improvements in Hong Kong. So here's just a little slide showing the, outlining the details a bit. So the goals are to improve Beijing water supply and alleviate poverty and it is an area where there's been um, a lot of hazards every year or, um, in the impact of sort of earthquakes and landslides and flooding has amounted to billions of dollars. Um, that's what's sort of shown in some of the pictures here. It's a very remote and isolated set of mountains where coming in and out from villages would take you know, a week or a month to walk, sorry. Um, but the intent is to move over a 10 year period about 2.4 million people. By contrast, the Three Gorges project involved moving about 1.3, I think, million people. Someone can correct me. So this is a lot more than that. They're trying to change the way they implement as compared to what happened in the Three Gorges case. In that case, people were moved all over China. In this case, they're trying to resettle people pretty much in the same, it's all in the same Hong Kong municipality so that culturally and socially people will retain you know, their sort of networks, ideally, and be in the same kind of culture and social context, more or less. Um, and, and then the big question is, you know, what investment should be made? And I'll, we don't really have a, it's hard to develop a framework because it depends a lot on what policymakers are interested in having analyzed. So in a lot of um, rounds of work, the um, leaders of the project, um, Professor Li Shujua and his team at uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong University. And they, by the way, they've mostly worked on undoing the negative consequences of family planning policy. So they've mostly, for their whole careers, worked on how to uh, counteract those unintended effects and working mostly on women and other vulnerable groups in the context of demographic policy in China. But the idea is to look at, okay, what are the policy options? Um, and then considering you know, the infrastructure investment being made, how land might be managed to achieve what Beijing wants, and then migration, which is just a huge natural, or natural in quotes, it's an ongoing process that has nothing to do with this particular thing. Um, so this intends to move a certain number of people, but in China there are about 400 million migrants is the rough estimate now, of people pushing to move out of these really remote areas. So this is happening anyway, and it, overall they're trying to slow that process down. Um, but in this case they want to speed it up. And trying to look at both the human well-being of beneficiaries, um, mainly in Beijing, although they're beneficiaries locally, if you look at the reduced risks of um, landslides and flooding and things, and then look at <clears throat> the well-being of people providing, you know, providers and beneficiaries at compensation mechanisms, and then be thinking about how to, how to incorporate and bring together um, you know, the livelihoods and human well-being dimension of uh, what people are trying to achieve. So in the work we've um, led by Li Xu Zhuo and a bunch of people, more in the social sciences, health sciences, um, been surveying those that are moving. So the survey so far involves about 1,400 people in three categories. Some are staying. Um, it's a voluntary program too. In the Three Gorges case, you didn't have a choice, right? You were going to be flooded. So in this case, it's a voluntary program in theory. I, it doesn't sound that voluntary in some of the <laughs> locations, but it, um, overall there are a lot of people choosing not to move. And so it's interviewing those people, moving those that are moving, and then move, interviewing those in the recipient areas in the Moore Valley uh, land. And what they found is among those um, who are involved, so this is interviewing across the whole sample, the number one choice of various options that were given for achieving poverty alleviation 
was, you know, well, about a third are claiming that relocation would be an attractive option. But there are all these other options that um, people want investment in that don't involve necessarily moving, although you'd need to have a livelihood somewhere else if you were to use your new training and, and um, other benefits. And then if you look at um, among the relocation households, there have been 400 interviewed so far. Um, this is sort of what's presented as um, feelings about having moved and income as a result of having moved. So on the attitude toward relocation, I don't, I don't know how truthful that, you know, how well that reflects what people are actually thinking. When you talk about it, many people say there isn't really a cost to complaining, that often people complaining get paid more. And in the Beijing uh, Miwin case, they did greatly increase the payment to farmers to um, get more people to enroll in the program. But anyway, in this case, this is what, this is what you get. Um, with respect to income, most people are getting about no change. Some get a little increase. And a lot, it costs a ton to make the move. You have to build a house. You have to somehow get a new livelihood. It's a massive issue. So I, um, we're looking at that. We're also looking at um, the different asset classes and how those change at the household level among those you know, not moving, living in the mountains, those that have moved, and those that are not moving but suddenly are getting a lot more people as neighbors. And what you mainly see here so far, all of this is work is in progress, um, is that among those who haven't moved in blue, they have sort of the lowest asset levels in the various classes. Among those who are moving, they get more in the way of some social capital. Um, they get a lot less land, so there's much lower opportunity for maintaining a livelihood in farming. And then among those not moving, um, they're kind of so far the best off um, that are situated in the valley areas. But I, I, this is kind of midstream, and I can't give you kind of the end of the story. We're also using maps to map out where people could move and how much land there is. Um, that's all kind of in progress right now. And you know, how many people could actually live in these destination places and what the trade-offs would be based on the surveys that we've done so far from a human well-being perspective, looking at these different dimensions of well-being. But, so I won't go further on it now, but I wanted to lay out that in terms of policies, you could think, well, at one level, this is really extreme. Um, but at another level, when you look at the degree of conflict and pressure over resources elsewhere, it seems likely that we're going to get into this kind of analysis. And maybe you, you already are in other context. Then in the last um, case that I'll give you of Hainan Island, actually I'm looking at the time, I don't want to keep you too late. In this one, I'll go really quickly and then I want to get to one other topic. Um, in, in Hainan, it's much more a matter of um, changing not where people live but their local livelihoods. So Hainan Island, if anybody's on the ecological side, you'll have heard that there's been a doubling of rubber plantations in roughly the past 10 years, and, and that continues, driven by the automobile industry and the demand for rubber. And, and it's sort of wiped out much of the remaining natural forest. Um, and it's a highly biodiverse place, and it's sort of the ecological province that's now a priority for trying to bring um, more sustainable practices um, into play. So. Here's the typical rubber plantation. When it rains, there's no understory and there's no real soaking up of the water. A lot of it'll just rush off the land. And um, here's the change. You can see rubber production in red, just the change over that 10-year period. Um, and what it led to, I happened to be there when flooding occurred in about two years, no, three years ago now. Um, and this was in the national park where there's still a lot of native forest and the water was running clear. And then just outside, um, the water was running red with soil washing away off of the entire landscape um, and out into the, you can't see it that well, but just flooding out across the coral reefs. Um, <clears throat> so just brought home in a very visceral way how 
um, these services do operate and how little time there is in a way to try and get some of these projects implemented. Um, and so the main intent here is to try and develop better management within rubber plantations and also to look at the option of reforesting with native forests, some of the more um, critical areas from a flood perspective. So here in this other kind of management, there's a lot of areca nut, many other sort of medicinal plants and spices and nuts and high value crops interplanted with the rubber. And the analysis involves some modeling that I'll show really quickly here, plus some experimental farms where they're trying to shift to these other practices rapidly and try and make it economically viable. Um, so looking at the change over that 10 year period with a decrease in purple and an increase in green, you see mostly we had a big decrease in different services as a result of losing the natural forest. Um, and then in a restoration scenario for the future, you would, you'd gain a lot, but you would, you'd lose livelihoods. What are people gonna do if they're not growing rubber? Um, so looking at a mix of options, this integrated management where you've got all these different crops interplanted with probably some decrease in rubber productivity, but hopefully at least pretty well offset by these other um, commodities produced you'd get a lot of benefits. So that's what's kind of being implemented there. I just wanted to give you a flavor of the different ways in which this um, policy is now being tested out and sort of implemented in China. Um, and what I'd like to do um, is skip ahead. I don't want to keep you too late. There's, there's another side to this um, that we don't talk about much and that's just being opened up, I think, in um, and so I'm going to skip ahead to that, um, and we'll talk more in discussion later. In, in Latin America, like I told you yesterday, and I'm, if you missed it, no worries, but the same kind of projects overall are going in in about 35 cities across Latin America using this sort of targeted investment approach that involves changing a lot of livelihoods and um, improving water quality for cities downstream. But what I want to switch to now is um, one more thing before going ahead. We're taking these approaches in the disaster risk reduction area. Um, but the thing that's worrying me the most and that I'd love to get your insight into is more the urban urbanization trend worldwide. So when we think about conservation, we, there is more and more talk about how to keep people in cities connected or reconnect them to nature. Um, but, but the, the new area that's opening up and that there's been quite a bit of work on here in the UK is in kind of the mental health dimension. So it's amazing how high the burden of mental health problems is in cities as compared to in countryside. Um, so in terms of anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and a variety of other things, like rates of schizophrenia are much, much higher in urban contexts than in um, rural places. And people have been looking into this, and it doesn't seem you know, a matter of just the way we measure um, the incidence of problems. So recently, there was a study by a guy in Germany, Andreas Meyer-Lindenberg, who um, got a lot of attention. He scanned the brains of people who came from different places while they were under stress. So he, he stuck them in this scanner. How many of you have heard about this work? Um, so the people are stuck in a scanner. The, the way they're stressed out is they're given math problems by a guy that's there like to the side and the math problems come up on a screen. So you're lying there with the magnet doing your brain and um, they're pretty simple math problems that if you weren't under stress, you should, everybody would get right pretty easily. This little addition and subtraction division problems. And, um, but the people are told actually that they're doing a horrible job, that they're getting them mostly wrong, and that it's super expensive and their data are not even gonna be useful to these grad students if the people don't sort of wake up and get on the ball <laughs> and answer the questions correctly. So I didn't even realize this was allowed, but <laughs> um, it's commonplace, it's, it's Montreal stress protocol. <laughs> and um, so what they found that was astonishing was that people, um, from 
who'd grown up in countryside and more rural areas were much less likely to get fully stressed out and more likely instead just you know, not let the people bother them than people from cities. Um, and that was reflected in one part of the brain that is kind of wired in at a young age, in between the ages of zero and five. And then in another part of the brain that's active and always changing through life, you could see where people live today. And they got a really good predictive sort of relationship between the population density in which a person had grown up and in which they live today based on these stress responses and the activity of these two regions of the brain um, when they're undergoing their little math test. So that work, um, and there's a lot of other work now going on comparing, and this is by a grad student of mine um, working most closely with psychologists, but comparing, trying to figure out, well, what elements of nature are important in conveying these apparent benefits and trying to actually measure what are the benefits, sort of a production function approach to you know, the amount, the area of nature, what elements of nature need to be in the area. Does biodiversity matter? Or does just a green lawn and a few trees do the job? And what sort of frequency of experience do you need with na the, these bits of nature to have these benefits? And over what duration? Those are kind of the questions. And what my student is doing is busing people from the Stanford campus. Okay, so this is controlled experiment um, on this really nice hybrid fuel bus. And you either get out to El Camino, if you know the area, this not very nice sort of six to eight lane road that runs alongside the university, or you go up into this very nice area called the Dish, if you've been at Stanford, um, where you can have a much more peaceful stroll. So people then stroll for 46 minutes, because that's how the bus timetable works, um, in one of the two places, and they're randomly assigned. And they're told that they have some kind of photography mission, so they, they have to get certain photos, and they don't really know what the study is actually about. And these are just two photos taken by two different participants. The unlucky participant on the left and the, the lucky one on the right. And it's incredible. I, he's just working up the data now, so I don't have a final sort of slide to give you, but I would in a month or two. But the impact is tremendous. I had, I had worried that um, he wouldn't, you know, that there was a high risk in this thesis problem that he was picking up and was trying to get him to do some other things and some of this. But it's incredible how pronounced the effects are. So he measures all kinds of things like working memory, how well you can remember a string of numbers or turn it around backwards or how well you remember some letter that came up three um, steps ago in a flashing string of letters, say, or how quickly you can stop your impulse. There, there are all these standard psychology tests that people um, now inflict on these study participants. Um, and then there's also a lot on mood and on how much you ruminate, how much you're thinking about kind of mistakes you made in the past in your life and how regretful you are of those and what a loser you are and things like that. And so people on the left, they come back in this ruminating state and um, performing really well on all these little tests of mental agility and those on the right come back just flying high and um, ready to take on the world. So after 46 minutes, you know, so I wanted to bring this up in the context of urbanization and thinking about whether we can apply this realm of science and work it into some of the big policy issues that apply here. And in the UK, there was this study published a few months ago that you might have seen on TV or something. It got a lot of play showing how much happier people were in this longitudinal look over 17 years of 10,000 people in the stretches of life where they were in cities with more open space, more green space. They were significantly happier, and they also had no idea what you know, was going to be analyzed in terms of their reported self-happiness um, over time. So it's, it's a really interesting area that's just kind of opening up with new approaches. And what I want to um, end with, let me think, I'm, I'm skipping some of this, but is um, maybe a last thing just to say, maybe it doesn't always have to be this complicated. And I want to 
tell one quick final story in terms of this theory of change and how to influence policy and what science we can bring to achieve these outcomes we're reaching for. In the state of Alabama, which is the poorest state in the U.S. by many measures, um, there's been this effort on the part of the Nature Conservancy to um, use public funds to increase the amount of protected land and access to that land. Um, and when they surveyed people prior to um, the last election, there was sort of a 15% approval rate of this kind of expenditure of public funds as compared to putting it into education and healthcare and all the other things, unemployment. And then they sent out these postcards, and this was one postcard, there were four postcards. Um, here's the other one, uh, one of the others. That's all they did, they sent out these postcards and then they resurveyed people and they hire pretty expensive firms that do these phone surveys and stuff, so they get pretty decent data, they, they look at a lot of people. And the approval rating went way up after getting these postcards out and indeed the ballot measure passed by 85% approval rating after just a few months. And it's hard, I don't know what that proves overall, but I just want to bring it up. It um, raises the interesting possibility that maybe we could do some of this more easily and without all the agony of all the, the science that we're trying to bring to um, achieve these better outcomes. But maybe we can, in the, given the urgency, broaden our thinking in terms of how we communicate and how we tap into values that are there but just don't get them expressed because the way we talk about conservation is so foreign to so many people. But if we relate it instead in ways that um, touches upon really viscerally held values, um, we might be able to achieve a lot more, um, much more rapidly. So then finally in closing, I just want to bring up this Chinese proverb that there are these three pathways to wisdom the first is through contemplation, and that is the noblest, and certainly everybody here would, on a Friday evening, would have to agree with that. Um, but the second is through imitation, and that's the easiest. The third is through experience, and that's the bitterest. And I feel we're kind of in this tension now over how we allocate you know, our bit of time and effort in our moment on, you know, in life here to moving us away from the bitterest of experience as societies and hopefully much more into the realms of contemplation, developing um, really effective approaches and seeing them adopted widely. But I'd love to get now, I thank you very much for your patience and attention and I'd love to get any comments and reactions you might have whether now or uh, later. Thanks.